that we don't need to continue to try to reinvent the wheel evangelistically. Churches all across America and the world are looking for new, fresh ideas to win souls for the kingdom. And the author advocates that we don't need new ideas. We need to be more intentional about praying and being driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the author shares a quote by Martin Luther, <clears throat> where Martin Luther talks about that the hardest part in the Christian walk in developing a relationship with Jesus is developing a prayer life. And I can tell you personally, there are times in my life where I've struggled with that. And it takes time, it takes intentionality, especially in the world that we're living in where there are so many things that want to distract us and pull us away from truly having a prayer life with Jesus Christ. But I found that when you will be intentional, even when it's hard, even when it's a struggle, that God will bless you in that. But Jesus has given us a command. He's given us a command in Scripture that I want to look at this morning. Let's bow our heads one more time. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a privilege we have to come and worship this morning. We know that no matter where we are during the week, that we can call upon you and, and we can ask your presence to be with us. But there's something special about coming together as a, a body of believers and worshiping. So, Lord, I pray that you will bless our hearts, that you will speak to us this morning, and that we can leave here encouraged, ready to face another week. In Jesus' name, amen. I came out of college <clears throat> finishing my theology degree with great aspirations, thinking that I was going to take the churches by storm and, and really transform the churches that I was pastoring. And I was naive. One, one of my plans and, and one of my passions as a pastor, and it's the same passion that I carry with me as ministerial director, is discipleship, especially in the area of working with church elders. And, and I won't go into this today, but your pastor is not a full-time employee. He's a full-time volunteer. And it's because of the faithful ties and offerings of the church, not only this church, but the church of the entire conference, that he's able to volunteer full-time in ministry. And so he is a church elders, biblically. Church elders and pastors are one and the same. They have the same function. Some just do it full-time, some do it part-time. But I had a great passion coming out of college, working with elders and helping them identify what God has called them to do and be a part of. And so I got into my first district as a pastor, and in three churches, I had one elder. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Just going to have to create some. And so one day I was uh, traveling. I was doing some visits to church members. And there was a gentleman in the church that was uh, riding with me. Uh, and he did a lot of the, in the three and a half years that I was there, he and I spent a lot of time visiting and doing Bible studies together. And so we're traveling one day. And I turned to him in the car and I said, you know, you're doing everything that a church elder does. Have you ever thought about becoming one? And without missing a beat, he said, absolutely not. Okay, I wasn't going to be, you know, daunted. So I started praying, saying, Lord, change this man's heart. I know that you have called him to be a leader and an elder in this church. And so six months later, we're traveling to a Bible study. I turned to him and I said, you know, I've really been praying and I really believe that God is calling you to be an elder in this church without missing a beat. He says, absolutely not. Here's what I've come to realize is I'd been praying the wrong prayer. I'd been praying the wrong prayer. There was a family in that church that my wife and I became very close friends with. There was a husband and a wife, their two daughters, and the, the mother of the wife, or the, the grandmother to the two daughters, lived with them. Very active, very faithful in the church. The grandmother had another son, that the minute he got out of high school, he left the church. But I got to know him a little bit, because he would often be at their house on Saturday nights when we were over there. And we had a, a love for college football. That was a way for us to connect and talk a little bit and had some good conversations. Uh, he started dating this young woman. He still didn't come to church, but the young woman started coming to church with his family. Eventually, they, become, they get married, they have a child. And what I noticed is, is after the child was born, I noticed when I was preaching right before the sermon, he would sneak in the back door of the sanctuary and sit in the back row. 
After church was over, he would abruptly leave. As time went on, he started coming to church more and more often and would come earlier and earlier. My wife and I took another assignment uh, in another district. And I got a call about a year later from the new pastor. He said this young woman that he had been dating and married to had made a decision to give her life to Jesus and become baptized. And the family was requesting that we would come, be able to come back and witness that baptism, which we did. And I walk in the front door of the church and I notice that there was a bunch of remodeling going on. And so I asked the pastor, I said, who's leading this project? And he said, well, you'll never believe it. This young man who has now been coming to church faithfully is now leading a remodeling project in the church. Time goes on, a couple years pass, that pastor goes somewhere else, goes to another conference. A new pastor comes into that district and I'm visiting with him at workers meetings. And he said, you will never believe this. I said, I pastored that church. I could believe a lot of things. He said, that young man has grown so much in his spiritual life that the church elected him to be the head elder of the church, and he has accepted. You see, while I was praying for God to move in a certain way, God was already moving and working to raise up leadership in that church to help them move forward. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Matthew or chapter 9, Verse 37, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, to set the context of what we're going to talk about this morning, I want to briefly skim through chapters 8 and chapter 9, because there are some stories in there that help us understand why Jesus said what he said. In, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now this to me is an amazing story. We don't know a whole lot about this man other than he comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing. That is an important statement. It's a very deep statement because he tells us that he acknowledged who Jesus was. And he acknowledged the fact by his statement that he believed that Jesus had the power to heal him. It was just a matter of whether Jesus was willing to do it or not. And so Jesus responds. He says, I am willing. Be cleansed. We move from that story to the story of the centurion. Verse 5, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now this is a Roman centurion. This is a heathen in the eyes of the nation of Israel. He comes to Jesus. He says, I have this servant that is dying. He's being tormented. And Jesus says, I'll come immediately and heal him. And he says, no, no need. Because he believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus didn't have to go to heal him. All Jesus had to do was speak the word wherever he was and that man would be healed. And Jesus looks at this Roman centurion and he says, I have not found one as faithful as this man in Israel. What does that mean? The nation of Israel, which God had commanded to be a light to the Gentiles, to call people out of darkness and to bring people into their nation, they had kept these people at bay. And so Jesus says, in all my house of Israel, I have not found one as faithful as this Roman Gentile centurion. As we continue, 
through chapter 8, we see a variety of miracles in Jesus healing people. In chapter 9, we have the story of Jesus uh, interacting with the paralytic who was brought in, and Jesus says, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And you would think that people would be excited to see Jesus heal a man, and instead the religious leaders become angry because of the statement that he makes. You can move through chapter 9 and see a variety of things. We see the story of the woman that believed that all she had to do, if she could just crawl through the dirt enough and just touch his garment, she believed that Jesus had the power to heal her. Story after story of Jesus working miracles. And finally, we get to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. As we've read, he's moving from place to place. He's healing sicknesses. He's healing disease. As we get to verse 35, and it tells us, it gives us a glimpse of what is going on in the mind of Jesus. As he's going around healing every sickness and disease, it says in verse 36, when he sees the multitudes, he's moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they're weary. They're scattered. They're like sheep having no shepherd. I wondered, as I've read those words, if Jesus felt the same way I did when I left my first district. I remember the last Sabbath, I was in one of the churches. I baptized two women, mother and daughter. And to even get them to the point of getting them in that tank and making a public proclamation for Jesus was a challenge. They had, they had great struggles in their life and in their family. And God had done so much to bring them to that point. But they had so far to go. And I remember wondering, who is going to shepherd these ladies? I mean, the church was nice. They were great at greeting people when they came into the door. They were great at sitting with them at potluck and visiting. But visiting with people at potluck and greeting them at the door is not shepherding. Shepherding is about investing time and energy into the lives of other people. It's about picking up the phone in the middle of the week and just calling him and saying, hey, I was just thinking about you on the way home from work. I was just calling to see if there's anything you need or if I could just pray for you. It's about being willing to invest in the life of someone else. And so Jesus looks around with compassion, the Bible tells us, because these people are wearied and scattered. It's not so much a physical tiredness or weariness. It's a spiritual weariness because Jesus could see that there were no shepherds to come to the spiritual aid of the multitudes that he was ministering to. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and he gives them this command. He says, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. One of the things I'm going to miss most about pastoring is the opportunity to be a camp pastor at Camp Heritage for a week. And I don't know what it is that they put in the water and the food down there that causes those kids to act in a certain way. Because the, the first time I was a camp pastor for a week, I go down to the waterfront, I'm standing on the dock, I'm talking to a couple of the staff members, and I notice that there's a group of junior one campers that have encircled and are whispering, and every once in a while, one of them will raise their head, turn around, and look at me. And finally, one of them broke from the circle, came on a dead sprint, and I knew what they were going to try to do. They were going to try to push me into the water. Luckily, I had about 100 pounds on them. And so as this young man, this brave young man gets closer, I reach out, I grab him by the life jacket, I pick him up, and I threw him as far as I could into the water. The next one comes, and one after another, they come right after you and, and just keep chucking them in the water. Some of them are brave enough, they circle around, get up the ladder, come back to the dock, and they try to make another run at you. Till finally they got smart. And they realized that if one can't accomplish the task, Five can, and they were right. <laughs> but when Jesus talks about pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, that Greek word means that pray that God would grab people by the soul. 
that he would grab people by the very soul and cast them out into God's harvest. I wonder, I wonder if Jesus looks down from heaven. He sees the condition of the world. He sees the suffering and people struggling. And he sees that his sheep are weary and scattered and there's no shepherds. I wonder if he sees the single mom at the grocery store with her three kids and she's just trying to to get them through the the cashier's line. She's trying to make ends meet and the kids are are restless and causing problems and getting into trouble. And, And then right behind her is the individual that attends church every week and looks at her with a judgmental attitude wondering why she can't keep her kids in line. I remember hearing the story of the, uh, the, the husband and his four children riding the subway car in New York City. It's six in the morning. He, he's just sitting there looking at the floor, not even saying anything, while his kids are jumping from seat to seat, bumping into people, and they're just being a nuisance. And, and, and the rest of the travelers on the subway car are starting to get upset and frustrated. And finally, a woman speaks up. And she says, are you even paying attention to your kids? The man looks up, looks around, sees what his kids are doing, and looks at the woman, and he says, I'm sorry. We've just left the hospital where my children lost their mother. And I guess that they're dealing with it the only way that they know how. You see, we struggle as followers of Jesus to identify with the struggles of others that are different from us. I used to think that I was a very gracious person until I had children. Because my wife and I, when we were dating, we would go out to eat, and you'd see these families with young children, and it looked like a tornado just swept through their table. I mean, there's macaroni and cheese and spaghetti all over the floor. And I used to wonder, why can't they keep their kids from doing that? And then I had children, small children. And we tried to take them out to eat. And now you are the parent that looks like a tornado just rolled through your table. And you realize that you're not as gracious as you thought you were. I wonder if Jesus today is looking down, wondering, pleading with his church, like he did with his disciples, to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors in to his harvest. I'm going to ask you to turn with me. You can hold your place in Matthew. We'll come back. But I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the Old Testament prophet has a vision. And in fact, there, if you listen to contemporary Christian music, there was a song that was written based on this passage of Scripture. The prophet is given a vision by God, and it's a valley full of dry bones. And in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, the, Lord, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me in, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came to to them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. 
I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. A valley. A valley full of dead skeletons. And God was trying to send a message to the prophet that he could deliver to the people that it represented the nation of Israel and, and their spirituality. They were completely dead. And the interesting thing that God says to the prophet is, I will raise you up. I will raise you up and I will put my spirit in you and then you shall know that I am the Lord. Have you ever felt spiritually dead? Have you ever felt spiritually dry? I have. And the message from God to you, it is that there's nothing inside of you, that there's nothing that you can do to be able to spiritually revive yourself. It is the Lord that will put his spirit in you. And then you will know that it is the Lord, your God, that will raise you up which will then in turn help you when you face other times of spiritual dryness because you will know where to turn. But have you ever thought, and I have been guilty of this, have you ever looked at somebody, a family member, a friend, a coworker, and you said there is no way that that individual will ever give their heart to Jesus Christ? And God's message to us when we have those feelings is that God has the ability to create in somebody where it seems that there is no chance of spiritual life, God has the ability to put his spirit into them. That when they feel that spirit, that they will respond. And not only will that person recognize who the Lord their God is, but you in turn will recognize who the Lord your God is. Because you're seeing God work a miracle in somebody who you thought would never come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus commands his disciples. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Are you willing to take that seriously? As individuals, are you willing to read this as a command from your Savior that every morning and every evening and throughout the day you are praying to the Lord of the harvest to grab people by their very souls? Because the harvest truly is plentiful. Are you as a church willing to pray that? If I went around the church today and, and asked each of you to comment on what you think the best way is to reach the surrounding communities, I'd probably get 50 different answers, which is fine. God has made us different. We have different ways of viewing things. But can a church come together as individuals and say, we are going to commit ourselves to this prayer and believe that God is going to answer that prayer and be believe that some of the people that he is going to, be, to raise up to be laborers in this community have not even joined the church yet. I want to end this morning with Acts chapter, chapter 1, verse 6. <coughs> Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, you've all heard the expression, hindsight's 2020. But we can read this passage, and, and I've asked myself at times, what were these guys thinking? They had just spent over three years walking with Jesus, seeing him ministering to people. Heal people emotionally, physically, spiritually. And they asked Jesus what would seem one of the dumbest questions somebody that had spent so much time with Jesus would ask him. Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? What they were asking is, Jesus, are you now going to make Israel, and are you going to put them in their rightful place in this world? 
Currently, the nation of Israel was under Roman rule, which they did not like. And they were still thinking that Christ had come to set up an earthly kingdom where the nation of Israel would rule. Notice how Jesus responds to this. Verse 7, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria until the end of the earth. Jesus, as gently as he can, seeks to redirect their attention. From when Jesus would set up a kingdom to what Jesus wanted them to do. And I wonder if Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. I got an email about two months ago. And it's not the first time I've received this type of email. I've I've seen this email for years. But the email basically said this, and the person was asking for me to give my opinion. The email was supposedly a news article that was stating that President Trump and the Pope had a meeting together where the Pope was encouraging President Trump to start Sunday legislation. And the person asked me what I thought, whether I thought it was true or not. And my response is, I don't care. I don't care. We have been told through Scripture and the inspired pen exactly, almost exactly what will happen before Jesus comes. Not all the details, but the big picture details we have been given. And whether that happens next year or in 10 years is of no matter to me. Because I wonder if Jesus is saying, sometimes we as Seventh-day Adventists, we can be end-time junkies. Where we are trying to examine every piece of evidence, everything that we're seeing in the news and how that relates to end-time events. When Jesus is trying to tell us, look, it's not for you to understand those things that God has put under his own authority. But maybe what Jesus is speaking to the church today, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put under his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Nevada and Ames and Des Moines and all of the areas till the end of the earth. And I wonder if Jesus is challenging us to quit looking at all the events and everything that the president is doing and everything that the Pope is doing. And I wonder if he's calling us to become active in the lives of the people that we live next door to. I remember the story uh, that I heard several years ago. Uh, There was a Delta flight and uh, a Delta stewardess or flight attendant now was going from seat to seat handing out drinks and a a man asked the the stewardess, how do you like working for Delta? And her response is, well, Delta signs my paycheck, but I work for God. What God is asking us to pray for will have a profound impact on our lives. Because the question we have to ask ourselves, are we an answer to Jesus' prayer? Are we an answer to that prayer? When we get up in the morning, when we go to work, when we go to school, are we praying and asking God to fill us in such a way that our hearts and our minds would be open that when we see that somebody is struggling, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus to be able to share what God has done for us and what he can do for them. You might be sitting there saying, that's not my personality. I'm not that forward. I understand. But I believe that God is looking for healthy people that he can run across your path. Where God is doing all the work. Where God sends somebody who is struggling into your office. Where you don't even have to go to them. Are we willing to be an answer to God's prayer? Are we as a church be willing to be intentional? Intentional. Intentional. That's not even a word. Intentional. About praying the prayer that Jesus has asked us to pray. 
about praying that God would send people across our path that we could personally minister to. You see, I don't think we need some hip way of reaching our communities. I mean, I get, as ministerial director, I get every day almost people wanting to promote to me and sell me some type of program that I can promote in the churches that is all of a sudden going to make the churches grow. Fact of the matter, that's been happening since the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And as I read in this book that I've been reading, what God is looking for is churches that are not acting like power boats that are seeking to move from their own power, but churches that are willing to be like sailboats, where they are catching the power of the Holy Spirit, and they are moving as God is leading them. Heavenly Father, forgive us. Forgive me for not being as intentional and focused on what you have asked me to do personally. Forgive us as in our personal devotions as we have probably, myself included, read through these verses before and not truly understood how profound they are for the days that we are living in. We see events happening around us and we wonder what else could possibly happen. But I believe that Jesus is being merciful to the world, not wanting any to perish but he's also being merciful to us because we've failed in our calling as Christians. Lord, I pray that you will grab each of us by the soul, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would understand that it is you, the Lord, our God, who creates a spiritual life in us, And that spiritual life can be created in our coworker, our next door neighbor, our family members who seem so far away from God. Lord, help us to be the answer to your prayer and help us become intentional about praying that prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.